Hey there. Jarvis, how's it going, brother? Good, man. Good to hear from you. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's been a year since we spoke last. Memorial Day. I believe so, yeah. How's everything in your world? Crazy. <laughs> uh, good. Everything's good, man. Everything's been rolling a lot. I, I, a lot's happened since then, but that's, that's usual with us, you know? Yeah, you just finished up a tour with Anvil. Europe is awaiting you, and of course, the new album is ready to drop. Darkness Remains. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, you've been sitting on Darkness Remains for a long time now. You had that in the can when we spoke last spring. Yeah, we we added some stuff though. It it was done. It was done, and it wasn't. We we recorded those bonus tracks when we came back from the the, last, the Carcass tour, and the, we uh, also did a did a, another song on it, Black Widow. It was nine songs originally, so uh, we had to you know we had to get it to that thirty eight minute mark. You know, so it was a little short. And we kind of wanted to complete the whole thing. So, you know, it's that and the touring and also the record labels, you know, lining it up for a proper release, having a tour set up around it, that kind of stuff, you know. So, but, uh, but, you know, I mean, I feel it's the right time, honestly. Yeah, and we talked about that last time about, you know, giving Curse of the Dam proper time to get out there and be appreciated by fans and give everybody a chance to discover it. And now it's the time for Darkness Remains. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we we did a month in South America in February. So on Curse of the Dam, you know, we had yet to tour down there for Curse. So like that kind of wrapped it up, and we went right into Anvil, which you know we released a couple singles. So that tour was kind of like a teaser, like a lead up to to be the release of the album. So I'm, I'm definitely satisfied, you know, with uh, with all the tour, touring on Curse. You know, yeah, we did we did speak about that before. I remember, you know, and I really, you know. I really wanted to give that record a shot, you know, and really kind of saturate, you know, the world with it before moving on. So, so yeah, you know, the fans and the people that really know us, they've, yeah, sure, they've been waiting, you know. Didn't stop them from coming to the gigs when we would come around. And, you know, they're more familiar with the material as well, which is really nice. But here it is. We're here. <laughs> Absolutely, you know, and we talked about the new record a little bit when we spoke last time, but in finally hearing it, I'm blown away with how consistent it is, especially when you recorded it in what, like a week? Mm-hmm, yeah, uh, thank you. We uh, we spent a lot of more time on this record with the actual sounds as opposed to being in the studio and taking time to you know, do multiple takes and such, you know, you know, with Chris with Dan, we, we did it in three days. However, you know, we were, we, there's two versions of that album. I don't know if you know that, but there's, there's one that has never been heard. You know, we recorded that album seven months prior to the one that you, that you hear. Um, and we spent three months in the studio doing that record, you know, but after all the touring and everything, we kind of thought we would go back in and do it raw, you know, and, and that's what we did. But with this record, you know, like I said, most of the time was spent on getting the right drum sounds, the right bass and guitar sounds. There's no rhythm guitar tracks on this record. So it's, it's actually, I think it has a higher production value than Curse of the Dam, but at the same time, it's, it's a little more stripped down. There's like less going on. There's less tracks. You know, it's more focused on what the three piece band is like. It's really kind of the record we wanted to make, you know, as far as sonically. I wanted to go in there. It's like Van Halen 1. You know, like I listen to that record and I'm like, man, it sounds so full. And there's, you really just hear the three guys playing the instrument, you know. It follows Curse of the Dam perfectly, but also demonstrates some growth in your sound. You refined it, like you said, a little bit, but it also seems like you've grown into your skin here on this record. I Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I think the songwriting's a little more sophisticated. Um, you know, we have a new guitarist, obviously. He's been in the band for about a year and a half now, and uh, he's amazing. And I've, I've known him for over 20 years. Uh, he, he actually, a lot of people don't know this. I don't know if I mentioned this to you before, but, you know, we asked him to join the band when we started. Right. <laughs> we wanted to tap two guitar players, but he was, he was not available. But, he, you know, he produced the EP and the anchors of the dam, so he's been with us the whole time, just not on the stage. And, uh, you know, he's such a great guitarist that the the, pos the possibilities for us musically, I mean, I don't want to say they're limitless, but, I mean, it's it's pretty, it's gone to another level. So I'm able to, to convey ideas to him, and he he just does it, you know, and uh, it's, it's really nice to have that, you know, because, like, you know, I could write heavy metal heat 20 more times, but 
I just kind of don't want to. You know, I think that song stands on its own. You know, that, you know, it's hard. In heavy metal, you want to, you, you, you don't want to keep writing the same kind of song over and over again. It's hard not to sometimes, you know. But I think so far with our three releases, you know, with the 25 original songs in the band's catalog, I think there's some good diversity there. And I hope that in the future we can continue to do that. I was going to say, uh, Armand's playing on this record is really amazing. I mean, I've heard him live, but I wasn't sure what to expect on the record, and he really energizes every song. So. Right. I mean, yeah, you saw him live, but he's playing someone else's stuff and improvising a bit. It's like 75-25, you know, but for him to have a like a blank canvas to solo over, it really it really shines through on this record. This is like a good... I, I feel this... Like, I think of this that new album as like... It's like a guitar player's album, you know? Like, for sure, you know? It's like, it's a guitar hero album. <laughs> I think you did more with your voice on this record. Is that a reflection of your increasing confidence as a vocalist, or did you go in knowing you wanted to try some new scenes? Um, I think it's just experience. I think it's just all the road, you know? Right. I think it's touring and, like, knowing, like, hey, I can't blow my voice, you know? I, I'm still going to go for it. And just learning different ways. You know, like, I... uh. I still study, I still take lessons from different people, you know, I've kind of developed my own method, but I'm always learning new techniques and stuff. It's funny, like, the body is, um, you know, and your voice is an instrument, and I'm a smoker, man, I smoke like a pack of cigarettes a day, you know, so that's kind of been a struggle, like, in the past, but I've learned how to, like, tune my body physically in a way, or, or go to different places in my body to get the, the voice that I'm, that I'm looking for for certain for certain stuff you know I don't want to be a one dimensional singer by any means but again I think a lot of it comes from experience and like you know the diaphragm it, it muscle is definitely that it's a muscle and if you don't exercise it it will go away you know and you have a lot of work to do so I think consistently singing night after night kind of it really got me to that point you know and the first band I was ever in about 20 years ago was the first time that I ever that anybody ever wrote about me you know we were like in the local paper and I used to play guitar and sing at the time, and, you know, I was in high school, and I, I remember them, I still have the article, they wrote that, you know, I was a great guitar player and this and that, but the band needed to get a singer because I was horrible, you know, and, like, I kind of shelled up for a couple of years after that, it really, it, it affected me pretty bad, I mean, I knew I wasn't good, you know, but just to hear it and see it publicly for the first time that anybody talks about you, kind of smashes your dreams a little bit, but after a while, I kind of just used that as fuel and said, you know what, I have to at least try, get good. And so that's my whole path, you know, and I'm, I, I'm continually trying to, to be better, you know, and I don't think that's ever going to stop. So you can hear the progression from the EP to Curse of the Dam to the new record. So who knows what I'm going to sound like on the next one, you know. It's, it's like a James Hetfield thing or something, you know, except hopefully I don't get to the point where I'm doing like a bunch of ooh yeahs and stuff like that, you know. <laughs> yeah, you don't want anybody mimicking you on Saturday Night Live or anything. Exactly, exactly. Did you have new things that you wanted to or set out to try on this album, or is all this growth and expansion just sort of where the new songs took you? Well, you know, I got to give credit where credit's due. Um, Brett, our old guitar player, had a lot to do with the writing of this. You know, he, myself, and Dustin had like, you know, 65% of the record, like the skeleton was done before he departed. So it's, it's and, and, I, and I'm happy about that, to be honest, because you don't want to, you know, getting a new member in the band is, you, especially with three guys, you know, you don't really want to take that big of a leap immediately as far as, uh, you know, where you can tell, like, hey, this is like a, a, this sounds like a different band. You know, it could have been that situation, you know. I still do the majority of the writing, so that's not really much of a concern of mine, but it was definitely good to have Brent's influence on this record. I, as far as, I mean, to fully answer your question, though, I think, like, you know, the title track was something that, that was intentional. You know, I had written that song long before Armand was in the band, and yeah, we did want to do, we did want to extend ourselves a little bit and do something like that, you know, have some more clean parts, have some more ballady parts, you know, I mean, I always love that stuff, and, you know, it's not always about playing a thousand miles per hour all the time, we still have, I mean, we still have some pretty fast rockers on this album, which, are, and some really heavy songs, some of the, some of it, I think, is the heaviest stuff we've done. So I like the diversity, and I like I like the mix of it all, you know. So, but, but everything on the record was intentional. Every song and the order that they're placed in is completely intentional. There was no surprises. 
I mean, that's why we're able to go into the studio for such short periods of time is because we really, really work on these songs and we demo them till the day is done and we we rehearse them, you know? Like, we, we play as a live band in the studio. We don't use a click track. We play in the same small room. There's bleeding, the amps bleed through the mics. We're at full blast. We don't wear headphones, you know? I mean, so so you have to be tight as a band. You really have to know your, your material if you're going to do it like that. But I like to get in and out. I don't like to spend a long time in the studio. And plus, you know... I've never really had the financial luxury of doing that anyway. So, you know, sometimes uh, magic does happen in there and you end up writing a song or, or two or, or you're coming up with some different parts from the demo and stuff, yeah. which is cool, but I don't like to go in there blind. It, it blows my mind how some of these bands, they go in and they say, you know, we're going to the studio for two or three months. We have no material. We're going to write it in there. I mean, I think that's cool. I just don't know if I would ever be able to do that. That seems like a lot of pressure. I think the way you do it is more organic. Yeah. There's a lot of diversity on this record, but there's also a lot of continuity, and that's what you want to hear on an album. Exactly, exactly. Like, you can't you can't make huge leaps or changes um, in short periods of time. You know, it has to be an evolution, you know? So I'm happy about that. Cause, and you talk about pressure. I mean, that's all we felt was pressure on this. That's it. It was pressure the whole time because the last album did so well, you know? And people started to wait for the the new stuff, you know? So we were feeling it, man. I mean, we were definitely feeling it. And I'm, I'm, I'm pleased with the reaction so far. Yeah, you're getting a great response to the album so far. And you segued to this uh, a moment ago. You mentioned the title track, which has this cinematic and haunting quality to it. Tell us a little bit about that track and how did you create that ghostly vocal effect on there? Okay. Well, first of all, I'll preface it by saying the, the first song on the album, Welcome to the Night, which we have a video for, and then the fifth track, Life on the Run, and the title track, Darkness Remains, see, there, it's a trilogy, the songs. There's a storyline within those songs. And we do plan on producing the, you know, the, the other two volumes in the form of a video. It's almost like a mini movie, you know? Right. So you got the beginning, you got the middle, and you got the end. Like, that's the trilogy of the record. As far as um, recording the song, Armand's dad had this old, like, Leslie cabinet from the 70s. And I was singing the song in the studio, and I thought, you know, wouldn't it be cool if I ran my vocals through that thing, like Planet Caravan style or something, you know? I mean, let's just hear how it sounds, you know? And it was really old and rattly and stuff, and it, it created these certain kind of overtones in there that I was just like, wow, that is really, that's really cool, you know? And again, it really adds to the atmosphere of the song. Um, and if you compare it to like, there's a version I did with a with a dry vocal, you know, and and this one definitely has a lot more juice on it, you know, and um, it it served the song correctly. We played the song live the other night at our album release show. We played the whole record front to back, and uh, I did not use the vocal effect live. It's just a studio thing. Um, I do like singing it live, just as is. I think it it's pretty effective in a live environment. But as far as the record goes, I mean, I definitely think that was like. Sometimes you do things when you record. It's funny that it's a com like it could be a minor thing, but it's a complete game changer. Like even on the song "Hollowed Ground," you know that song never had vocal harmonies through the verses at all. And like in the in the midnight hour, man, the record's almost done. I said, you know what? Let me just go back to this song. I mean, the song was done. I was like, let me just try something, and I did that, and it just completely changed the trajectory of, of the whole thing. And, you know, Armand's a great singer, too. So live, we're able to pull off all of the harmonies on the record. I mean, it's it's great, you know. So, um, again, you know, it's like the, you, you're a three-piece band, and, you, you know, you have limitations. But I the one thing about Night Demon is, you know, we, we, we did not get in the game to reinvent the wheel or to create some new style of music. We just play kind of the stuff that we like. Um, a lot of it may seem like a throwback or a rehash sound, but there's been a lot of innovation within the band and a lot of things that have become a signature of the band just due to using the pieces that we have. You know, I mean, part of not having two guitars is you can't really do a lot of harmonies because you don't have that second guitar. And that's great for classic metal. But that's why we do, there's a, like our signature is there's a lot of guitar and bass harmonies. And no bands really ever do that. And it's kind of weird that nobody ever has. So, I mean, I'm, I'm definitely pleased with that, you know, like you put the work in and things just come out sometimes and it's like, wow, we, we're able to do so much with three guys 
And that's like really gratifying at the end of the day. Black Sabbath and Iron Maiden were two essential bands for you. Iron Maiden was for me the first band that really introduced me to the new wave of British heavy metal. And you pay homage to that on this record with the Maiden Hell song and even with the album art, it seems. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, well, I, I wanted that was the first song I wrote lyrically for the record. And I really wanted to do a tribute to the band. I started to write it and it, it would just seemed really cheesy, you know? I mean, it was too literal. And so I was like, where am I going with this? You know, like I almost scrapped it. You know, I purposely picked a uh, song musically that sounded least like least made an influence too. You know, I mean, if you, we are obviously having made an influence and priest influence and early account influence, but if you listen to the music on Made in Hell, then it's more like Rainbow or something, you know, like it's more like a Blackmore riff. It's, it's, it's the least made and inspired song from a musical standpoint. But so I started pulling out my LPs and I started just looking at the song titles and stuff. And I was like, wow, you know, I can make something out of this. So I just, you know, I, I wrote I wrote it within a half an hour and I just went chronologically with the songs and just kind of, I changed a lot of words around for it to make sense though, you know, and, and really tell a story with the song titles. And it's just one of those things, you know, like you can you can try and write I mean there's some songs you know like Howling Man took me a year and a half to write it did I mean it just I kept coming back to it and it was one of those songs that I never gave up on and it ended up being one of our classic tracks but at the same time I spent a year and a half thinking man this is going nowhere you know but with Made in Hell it just it's like lightning it doesn't strike twice you know you know what I'm saying so it was it was just I, I'm um, I'm a conduit you know, with that song, it's 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 not only about my personal experience; it's about every metalhead's experience with that band. Everybody that loves that band and grew up on it can relate to it. Can relate to that song. It puts you back in that period of going to the record store, getting that record, going home to your bedroom, listening to it, or you know, drinking beers in the back of a pickup truck with your buddies. You know, going to high school, being an outcast. And just like the power of Maiden, you know, and you know, I didn't use all song titles for the lyrics. There's some other stuff, the original stuff that I put in, like Edward the Great, you know, or I say, um, you know, I didn't mention any songs from X Factor or Virtual Eleven, but I did. There is a line that says, "Came out of a blaze to find the brave new world." <laughs> so, you know, I just the creativity was flowing once I had, you know, Maiden's the blueprint. I had the records, and I thought it was a real creative way to kind of say what I wanted to say. And again, you know, I don't I don't see any Maiden fan not being able to relate to that. So it's a really great thing, you know. And I remember my first Maiden song I heard. I remember the first record I bought. I remember the whole experience like it was yesterday. I think about it often and, you know, where it's what it's done for me, you know. And and Metallica too, you know. The New Wave of British Heavy Metal was really introduced to me through Metallica as well, you know, out of on a high level I mean there was it, before the internet you know there were there were bands that I had heard of and had read about that you know I hadn't actually listened to them for almost five years some of them you know I just couldn't get the records you know but those all roads lead from those bands for me you know I mean in, in suburban white Southern California those bands were accessible and they were the they were the best and I, I wanted to know who influenced them or who their peers were at a certain point and uh, discovered that those bands were, some of them, in my opinion, I like even better, you know, so. I remember going into a record shop up in Northern California and I bought, uh, it was a single, but it was on, you know, the big full LP single of Iron Maiden and I went home and I put it on and because it was the big full size LP, I put it at 33 RPM and I play this live track, Drifter, and it's like, the drifter and my friend and I are like oh my god this is so <laughs> sick and cool and it took us a week to realize we weren't playing it at the right speed but that was our introduction to Iron Maiden well hey look man I have I, I understand that my first LP was a Oingo Boingo record it was uh, Good for Your Soul and I was a kid man I mean like I had just somebody had just given it to me and that was the only LP I had for like two years and I and, and it was a 45 it was a radio promo and and i played that thing at 33 for two years man. and i was like oh no is the heaviest band ever you know <laughs> so so yeah man i totally get i mean that's cool but see those are the cool experiences you know that, that you have when you're um young and innocent you know and that's kind of the vibe that night demon 
we've, we're, tr- we're always trying to keep, you know, I mean, we've seen a lot of things and we, yeah, we get jaded a little bit sometimes, sometimes things, you know, if I looked at my career right now, 20 years ago, if this was happening, I would just be, I mean, I'd probably die over excitement. You know, I, I don't think I'd be able to handle it. I'd have a panic attack, you know, but I think with experience and, and with taking things one day at a time, you know, you realize that that's the best way to do it you know when you got to you got to be ready to handle things when they come you know you have to you have to have that preparation when when the opportunity comes up you know i wasn't ready for it then i wanted it bad but i'm just glad you know it's like we you want to be young again but i'm glad those days are over <laughs> Well, as we mentioned, Sabbath is another big band for you. And I thought I read somewhere that, oh, yeah. that you struggle with sleep neuropathy or something like that. And that played into the Stranger it's, it's, in the Room it, track? Yeah, Stranger in the Room. Yeah, a sleep paralysis. Sleep paralysis. And, and yeah, it's a scary thing, man. It's a scary thing. Uh, it happens. It's weird. Like, lately in the last couple of years, it's been happening more often than ever in my life. I read Tony Iommi's book, and he talked about one time when he was younger, he was able to exercise astral projection in his sleep. Where he basically got up out of his sleep and he went for a walk. He went down the street, he went down by the river, he went like down by his school, and he came back home and, and just went back into his body. And I thought that interested me a lot. And, you know, sleep paralysis is a terrifying thing, you know? It's, it's extreme panic, you're awake, but your body's asleep. You're in between this REM state of sleep and consciousness, and you're constantly floating back and forth between it in this panic. And a lot of times, you know, I can get out of it, but it takes a lot of mental power, and sometimes it takes a long time, and I can just wake up with this crazy, like, jerking reaction where my whole body will just, like, convulse, you know, to, to, to make myself, you know, move and stuff. But I actually had one episode where I was complete for some reason I was completely calm for about 20 or 30 minutes and I had decided that I w- was going to experiment with astral projection and I I mean look I'm not saying that this is real I'm not I'm not saying that uh you know I'm not some weirdo you know but I did it you know it was real like I got out of my body I went for a walk and yeah. I I did I saw some crazy things it's almost like I felt like it was bare, it was so real. Like I can re- trace every single step. I remember everything about it, and I don't remember my dreams. You know, I remember everything about it. I re- but it's weird. Things looked. This- I was in the same place, but things were different. Like things things were just slightly different. Things were in different places, or some some things were missing. Things were just weren't right. You know, it's almost like being in another dimension. You're in real time in reality but you're in, it's you're in another dimension within the real world. It's a trippy thing, man. I mean, you asked about it, so. <laughs> yeah, no, but last one before we get out of here, we'll call it the final question. You Staying busy is a good thing as long as what you're doing is fulfilling you. So beyond Night Demon, which is your, your primary thing, you've also taken on roles in Jaguar and Sirithungal, as well as managing the Frost and Fire Festival. Talk to us a little bit before we get out of here about each of those and what you get from each that fulfills you, because I know both those bands had a huge impact on you. Yeah, oh, absolutely. I, I mean, Jaguar, I mean, the, the Power Games record is one of my biggest vocal influences, you know, and I think that's pretty much how I got the gig, too, you know. With those guys, you know, they had approached me a couple years ago because they had heard the at cover of our cover of Axe Crazy. You know, they were looking for a vocalist for a while, and uh, it was one of those things, man, where it was like, um, you know, why couldn't this have happened to me sooner in my life? Because it, 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 I, I had to say no. I had to decline it. You know, these guys were living in Sweden at the time. They're back in the U.K. now. But, you know, I was in the middle of a three-month tour with Night Demon. I was in the States. And I just didn't see how that was going to work, you know. And uh, it, at the same time, it was completely gratifying to me because here I am at this stage in my life, and I'm turning down a dream situation because... Uh, what I've spent so long creating something of my own that is now successful and more important than that dream opportunity. And that's what really, that, I think that in my career, that, at that moment is when it really shifted for me and I, and I started to appreciate and realize like, hey, you know, you are living the dream, you know? There's a lot of pressure from society and, you know, family and stuff like this. People, 
the, the people who live in a mainstream society. They watch American Idol and stuff, so they have a different idea of success, you know? People want to be famous. That's not my goal. People want to be rich, and they only want to be rich so they don't have to do anything. You know, like that's not that's not the kind of life that I want. And so that situation really made me have an appreciation for what I was doing and just realize, look, this is happening now. So let's just enjoy this and let's let's get let's get on with this, you know. But, you know, a, a year and a half later, they contacted me again. And again, I was in the middle of a European tour this time, a long tour. And they said uh, and I they said, all right, well, screw it. If you're not going to do it, I think we're just going to break up. And at that point, I said, well, wait, wait, like, don't do that. You guys are too great for that, you know? Just, like, spare the the world of this, you know? Like, like you need to stay a band. So I just basically said, look, it, I know the next festival you have in England, I'm available. I know that for sure, that there's nothing on the books for me. So let's do it. Let's see how it goes. You know, we haven't even played together, but let's see how it goes. So I went and did that show with them. It was great. I met the drummer on stage. We had no rehearsal, but it's killer, and I still see videos from it. And it was a great situation. The guys in that band are amazing, and they, we've become really, really good friends. And now, you know, they're chill about it, and they're kind of working around my schedule. And that's cool. You know, it's better than nothing, I guess. So that's the Jaguar situation. Cirrus Ungle, whole nother story. You know, I'm from Ventura, California. They're from Ventura, California. We're really the only two metal bands from here, at least the ones that made it out. Back in the day, you know, nobody had an appreciation for that band. They were voted worst band in town once in a publication. You know, I have tons of articles that date back from 1978 to 1992 about, like, hey, where are the, where are the fans, you know? Like, why aren't people going to see this band? Like, like these guys are playing, they're putting out records, and, like, they get four people at a gig, you know? The band never toured. They played out of California once. You know, and they they slaved away in this rehearsal studio six nights a week, you know, trying to do their thing. They knew they had an audience overseas, but, you know, they didn't have the resources or the know-how to, to enforce that. You know, they didn't have any big business behind them, which that's how, how it was in the 80s. You know, you didn't have the, the DIY connection unless you were in the underground punk scene or something like that. And they had, um, they just didn't have those opportunities. You know, they had been approached by, by big management a lot. But, you know, the, the managers that they were approached by were like, okay, you guys need to start wearing makeup, stuff like this, you know. And they just weren't having it. You know, they wanted to keep their integrity and, and all that. And, you know, they basically got so fed up with the music business that they quit in 92 and, you know, they were just like, screw it. My, my life is going, our lives are going in a different direction. Nobody played music after that in the band. Nobody. Like, not, not only with each other, but in other bands. It was over. Like, you know, they hung up their guitars, they sold their gear, and they're like, I, I'm done with music. Like, I'm just done with it. I don't like it anymore, you know? So it's a sad thing. Um, I travel a lot through Europe and stuff, and, and people would always ask me, oh, you know those guys? I'm like, yeah, they're like my best friends, you know? And, uh, you know, a lot of people would tell, would tell me a lot, you know, you're never going to get them back together. It's never going to happen. That band's never going to play again. And I was always confident. I said, you know, it will happen. It's just going to take some time. And it took me years and years and years to, to put it together. But um, sorry, these stories are long, but they're interesting. Um, basically how it happened was, you know, Night Demons really started to explode. And, and as far as touring, you know, we were gone a lot. We started to be gone a lot. And those guys were like, hey, where's our buddies? You know, we're not, like, we want to drink on the weekends and hang out, you know? Like, where are you guys all the time? And we're like, we're gone, man. We're living the rock and roll dream, you know? And they became a little envious of that. And they're like, you know, that's what we always wanted to do. You know, we're so happy for you guys. But it's just a shame that we couldn't do that. And, I've, and I'm like, guys, I've been telling you for years, you can. You can do it now. You know, I just toured with Anvil. You know, and they had their movie in that thing. But you want to talk about a redemption story and some interesting characters, like Sarah Ungle, man. You know, like this is a whole nother cult status thing. Um, and these guys, I mean, they, they, I wanted them to have the redemption. So what I did was I created the Frost and Fire Festival. You know, I have a big background in, 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 in concert promotion. I've been doing it since I was 17 years old. I've also, as an, as an artist, played most of these underground metal festivals throughout the world. So I kind of have a good gauge on what works, what doesn't, what's good about some, what's bad about some, what the bands want, and how, what the promoters need to do, you know? 
So I thought it was a great situation. So I named it Frost and Fire in honor of them because it is in our town, and they are the metal legends that created, you know, the, the, some of the godfathers of metal, of epic metal, you know. But uh, I created that, and I said, hey, guys, I want you to come down and do an autograph signing session. You don't have to play, just come and do it. And everybody got on board. Some of these guys hadn't seen each other in decades, you know? So all these people are flying out from all over the country, all over the world, just to meet these guys, festival promoters even, just to meet these guys. And they were blown away. And I see, I, I told them, I said, I told you, you know, they always thought I was exaggerating about stuff because I had an agenda or something. But I said, no, I told you, this is legit. And there's thousands of more people where they came, where this came from, you know? So they started to kind of entertain the idea of it and um, basically I just kind of tricked them into it I mean it started like as you know I started I uh, had Robert play drums he hadn't touched a pair of drumsticks it's in 25 years I said come and jam with Night Demon you know so we were playing Ungle songs with him and then you know I said okay show up next week relearn these two songs and we'll be ready to go meanwhile I called Jimmy the guitar player told him the same I didn't tell the two of them that they were both going to be there you know and they had some beef from years past, but it immediately went away when they started playing. And then Brent left the fold, and then Greg came in, and then, you know, Tim came in. So it happened organically, but I really tried, man. I tried really hard, and I felt like now is the time. And now it's, it's, it's great. You know, the two bands were like family, and uh, I'm, I'm happy to be orchestrating the comeback of of this band you know I mean it really for these guys like you know they're at at 60 years old you know um, I think it saved them in a way you know I mean this is a this is a really big deal for them they're they're gonna get their due you know it it takes some time sometimes but if you if you quit if you know you're never gonna get it so I'm I'm happy about that and so that kind of wraps up the with the festival too you know I mean your question about the festival and with you know I will say one thing about the festival it's a double edged sword we've had to turn down two great tours this year this coming fall because of the festival you know and Night Demon like you, we always want to make ourselves available for any opportunities that come up this is our full time gig you know this is our passion this is our dream this is our, our baby this is our vehicle in life um so it was never our goal to go out and be these festival promoters, but at the same time, when people tell when people tell you they had the best weekend of their lives, you know, and you get people coming in from all over the world to your town to your invitational, we feel at this point a responsibility to the scene uh, to be ambassadors of this thing and to keep this thing going and to spread the word even further. So we're sacrificing our own careers for the greater good of the future of our genre and that's really all there is to it it's got to be absolutely gratifying i know i got to get you out of here so jarvis thank you so no worries hey rustin yeah. thanks man i'm sorry for rambling on and on i could talk to you for days but you got really good questions and i appreciate your interest in everything that we're doing and it shows and without without you man we're you know we're all in this thing together so i, I really do appreciate you you spreading the word for us absolutely when you come back from europe we'll get together and do a part two or something be safe out on the road enjoy the record is fantastic and i will let you get out of here absolutely thank you so much man we'll talk later take care